Max, quantum theory is one of the great human discoveries of all time. It tells us not something just fundamental about our world, but something astonishingly fundamental about our world. And you've had the great pleasure of working with one of the pioneers of the field, John Wheeler. And in, in looking at 100 years or so of the, all of the thoughts and developments of quantum theory, uh, what, what do you take away from that? What, do, what have you learned? Uh, what are some of the m mysteries that are still there? What are there some experiments we can do? It's, I'm consider, I find myself so lucky to have had the pleasure of spending time with John Wheeler. He's a, always been a great hero of mine uh, since long before I met him. And in talking to him, it's it striking how even way back with Niels Bohr and Max Planck, who was the first to encounter the quantum ideas, people figured out how to get the right answer to their calculations without really understanding what it meant. <laughs> and we're in this astonishing position now, a, a century later, that we still know how to calculate it all, and people are still arguing about what it all means. <laughs> and the calculations are precise to uh, incredible precision. They're some of the most precise calculations we have. You know, we can measure hundreds and hundreds of thousands of spectral lines, uh, wavelengths coming out of atoms, for instance. We can compute every single one of them with just three parameters as input. It's, it's, data compression at its best. It's a masterpiece of science. And still, people argue, but what does it mean? <laughs> so what does it mean? <laughs> <laughs> that depends on who you ask. It, 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 the big fuss is about what happens when you look at something which is supposed to be in two places at once, and you only see it in one place. So, In the kinds of a superposition that can be two things at the same time. Exactly. So it's well known that little particles end up in two places at once. And, big things are made of particles too, so they can also end up in two places at once. Niels Bohr, for instance, said that, well, when you observe it, then only one of the things actually happens. The reason a lot of people don't like that is because he never gave an equation saying what constitutes an observation and what's going on here. It's a so-called Copenhagen interpretation. Indeed. Then there are people who think that maybe something random happens which puts things into a de definite state, but that doesn't involve observation. There are some theories of this sort, which have been written down, which make the math a little more ugly and complicated, though. And it's something which falls a little foul of Occam's razor, <laughs> because you add more complications and you don't explain anything. And third, there is this idea which John Wheeler's graduate student, Hugh Everett, came up with in 1957, which is that, in fact, the whole randomness is just an illusion. And what actually happens when you observe something is that your own brain enters now a superposition of two different states, and the whole universe sort of splits in the two. And when I, when I asked John once what he thought of this <laughs> at Many Worlds interpretation, he, he smiled and thought for a while, and then he said, I find time to believe in it Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. <laughs> <laughs> He's a master of uh, keeping an open mind. <laughs> on these matters. But what's, what's so amazing about this is it's not just empty rhetoric. There are actually experiments you mm. can do which, which allow you to test this. Mm. In the old days, many people thought that quantum physics only applied to the atomic. And yet today, people have built bigger and bigger things which still obey quantum physics. You can now put a big, mo a big molecule like the carbon-60 buckyball at two places at mm -hmm, once. Mm -hmm. You can even do things with optical fibers separated by tens of miles, and the weird quantum stuff persists. And people are trying to build quantum computers, which can, in effect, even run separate calculations in superposition. W what does that mean? What, what can you infer from that? Well, what it means to me is that, that if these quantum computers are built and actually work, you really have to take seriously Everett's parallel universe interpretation, because in a sense, it's the ultimate parallel computer where the computation is really done in many parallel universes at the same time, and then you <laughs> do something clever and extract a useful answer. All right, l let's say that were true. Uh, how would that work? Ha ha in given, given a one second period of time, how many different universes would we be split into? Ah, well, there's constantly all sorts of things happening throughout right. the part of space that we can see. So you would quickly get up into numbers like a Googleplex, which is 10 to the power of Google. Yeah. where Google is one with a hundred zeros after it. So vast, vast numbers. But um, 
mathematics has no inhibitions towards big numbers, <laughs> and, and this, this gives all the correct predictions for but, everything but we it, measure. It would be triggered by what? By we triggered by every time a, a theoretical observation can be made, or, or what would trigger the split? According to Everett, the beauty is there is nothing that triggers it because there really is no split. There's only one universe where all these things are happening. But what Everett says is that when that we are very limited. If, if your brain is in a superposition of perceiving this and that, yeah. that's not how it's going to feel. You're not going to feel confused. Right. You're going to feel there's going to be one you which feels it's this way and another you that feels that it's that way. And you're only therefore aware of a small fraction of what's actually real. A and how often is this division occurring? Is this the, uh, uh, occurring with, with a decision I make or is it uh, occurring? Yes. You know, uh, Whenever there is a little thing that happens in the neuro neuro neuronal network of your brain, which involves something really atomic, so an ion that is in a synapse and yeah, could yeah, either yeah. go this or, or that way, which then causes a divergence of behavior, is sure, you'll think we'll split. So these sort of things happen all the time. That, it, it seems to be you're injecting consciousness, sentient activities that, that seem so wildly different in character from the structure of the universe. Although this plagued Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg also, who put consciousness in right there in the theory with big, bold-faced letters, right, <laughs> saying <laughs> that it's only when you become conscious of the universe that the wave function collapses. And, and um, that disturbed people even more because then people would say, well, what if uh, it's only a mouse doing the observing or a cat? Um, then, then what happens? And at least Everett's theory is purely mathematical. Consciousness comes in at a sort of secondary role. So I've always wondered, though, if there's some even more convincing experiment you could make to just convince yourself that this stuff is real. And uh, back, in, back when I was in Princeton having these fun conversations with, with John Wheeler, I came up with a really insane uh, idea, which I called quantum suicide, which I believe will actually definitively convince you that Everett was right and these parallel worlds are real, if it's true. Otherwise, unfortunately, <laughs> you have to pay with your life for it. So well, you have to really want to do it. How does it work? We know about Schrodinger's cat that either lives or dies. Right. So this is very much using the Schrodinger's cat m idea, but with you as the cat. Okay. So what you do is you set up a little suicide device. You take a, a machine gun with, and point it at your head, and you connect it to a quantum trigger. So every time a little quantum particle goes into doing two things at once, the gun either shoots or doesn't shoot. And now, if uh, Niels Bohr was correct, and only one thing happens, what you should expect to happen when you run this experiment is maybe the, you hear the go and go click, click, and then when it bangs, that's the last thing you'll ever hear. That's it. Right. Game over. Right. Whereas if Everett is right, since all outcomes always take place, there is always going to be one branch of the multiverse where you're alive, but that's the only one where you're aware. Right? So that means that with 100% probability, you predict that what you're going to perceive is a click. So imagine this now. You have this horrible contraction. So you take your head away from it, and you press your trigger a bunch of times, and it goes click, click, pow, click, click, pow, pow, click, click, in a sort of random fashion. Right, right. And it keeps going, and maybe you just put your head in front of it, and suddenly it's just going click, 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 click. Click, click, <laughs> click, 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 click. Every time you put your head in front of it, it stops firing. Because in those worlds, the only way that you can have perception is the, that those worlds in which you continue to exist, which, which actually becomes an increasingly small percentage of, of the totality. That's right. But that's fine because they all still happen. So if you did this experiment and it played out the way I just said, I think you would be convinced that Everett was right. <laughs> the problem is you would never convince anyone else <laughs> with that. Because, of course, you will perceive what happens even if I get killed, right? <laughs> now, there is a slightly more evil version of it, where instead I put a big bomb under our chairs here, so we both go together if we go. <laughs> then we'll both be convinced. <laughs> but I've never managed to find any colleague who would uh, <laughs> let me persuade them <laughs> in this fashion. So, uh, so when uh, you look at quantum mechanics and the quantum theory uh, in, in its overview, what, 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 do you f what does it tell you about the nature of reality? To me, it tells me that there's more to reality than first meets the eye. 
which I think is really very natural. We humans have kept finding out that there's more to space farther and beyond, and this is just yet a grander existence. And um, what I think is so fantastic about this is that not only does it affect our philosophical thinking in a deep way, but it also makes these testable predictions, right? So ultimately, if this is true, not only could you test it with a quantum suicide experiment, but it predicts that these quantum computers, however big we make them, will actually work. Mm -hmm. And the great thing is that great minds right now are trying to build them. And I think that means that this has shifted from being just pure philosophy and metaphysics to being a real science question. And I really look forward to see whether those computers work or not.